I am joining the monastery. At 24 years of age, Veronica chose her future life and made it known to her mother. It has been six years since that moment. As Nan Verovalnika says, she has never once regretted her decision. She made a decision and followed it through. She made St. Elizabeth's convent her home and its nuns her sisters. She grew up like all the other children. She spent time with friends, went on discos, dyed her hair and experimented with cosmetics. But as she now knows, God has a plan for every person. I'm Nan Veronica, I live at St. Elizabeth's Convent, and I'm 29 years of old. I grew up with my mother, I never knew my father. My mother was ordinary worker at the Minsk Optomechanical plant. I was an only child. My aunt, who lived nearby, was like a second mother to me. My grandmother took me to church when I was a child. She would get up while it was still dark, and as she was preparing to go to church, I would wake up and say to her, I'm coming with you. So we went together. I'm not sure what drew me to church or where I got it from. We never denied the existence of God. And one day my mother and aunt also believed in Christ and started going to church like my grandmother. It never occurred to me as a child that I would become a monastic. But then my aunt and mother started going to church, and it was a church of St. Peter and Paul at Nimiga in Minsk, where Father Andrei Limishonak was serving as a priest. There he had conversations with the parishioners. There were a few active churches at the time, so people came to hear his conversations from all over the place. He spoke in simple words, but they reached deep into people's hearts. Most important, he preached love, God and beauty. The people who came to hear him were looking for God, and Father Andrei showed them the way. Soon the convent began to be established. That was in Minsk, Novinki suburb. And the convent grew little by little, and my aunt and mother were taking me with them to attend the services there. That was when I saw nuns for the first time. They were in their black habits, and it was beautiful. I liked looking at them very much, I admired their looks. My later years also passed in contact with the convent in one way or another. I went to services, talked to the people there, and met the other children at the Sunday school. My mother had a friend among the nuns, so we were also in close contact with her. For me, monasticism was never shrouded in a mystery, and it never seemed remote and enigmatic. At the back of my mind, I always considered the possibility of a monastic life for myself. Yet I also had no definitive plan. I was not saying to myself, I'm going to be a nun, I will join a monastery. Far from it. I dreamed of great love, of marriage. But as years go by, the Lord puts people in a variety of circumstances. Little by little, my life came to revolve more and more around the monastery. But the change was organic, things were going their course. After school, I entered the teacher training university to learn to help children with learning disabilities. My choice of profession happened to be connected with the monastery's work. Here, at the suburb of Novinki, is the large mental clinic with two long-term care facilities adjacent to it, one for children with mental and physical disabilities, and the other for adults, for former children, patients who are transferred here when they grow up. The nuns brought these children for church services at the convent. I had been socializing with them from childhood and saw nothing unusual in it. I saw they looked and acted somewhat differently from others. 
But they did not stop me for a moment. I shared some of my toys with them and even had several friends among them. We met at church and we talked. Perhaps these meetings might have played a role in my choice of profession. I chose a distance learning program at the university and worked at the convent. We have a most unusual convent. Secular people can come and work here, just work and nothing else, and not just help in a church store or a church, but also work in other professions and grow here. We run a website with journalists and video operators, we make films and write various instructive texts, we run multiple workshops, and uh, people with artistic streaks who can paint, write or sing can realize themselves here. We even have a publishing center and much else. I studied at university for six years while also working at the convent. Increasingly, my life was becoming ever more connected with the life of the convent. I had friends, we spent time together, and my social life was not much different from that of my peers. But increasingly there came the understanding that simply being at a church service or simply socializing with other believers, priests, sisters of mercy or nuns, was giving me more joy than anything else in the world. Here is an example from my life. Uh, when I was still in the world, I used to like the Ukrainian group Akean Elzi. One day they arrived in Minsk with a concert, so I bought the tickets, gathered my friends, and we all went. I expected it to be a highlight, a moment of joy. I thought I would be happy at last. All of a sudden, I realized what was happening. The concert began. As the group was performing my favorite song, I hoped I would feel exhilarated. But nothing happened. I stood there dancing and singing to the music, but my joy was not genuine. I felt it very clearly. As we were walking home after the concert, I wondered why I felt that way after a concert that seemed so perfect. Then the reason became clear to me. I understood that the true joy of heaven, which I was really after, could not be found anywhere in the world, because it only comes from a life in God. By the time I had begun to take the holy sacraments regularly, a believer feels an outpouring of grace from the sacraments, which is indeed a joy and blessing from heaven. One cannot take it for anything else. That is how I became to understand that a life in God is far superior to any pleasures of the world. While I was still studying, I was keeping myself from decisive moves to give myself time to finish my studies and pray to God that He may send me the love of my life or give me an indication that monasticism is my way. I was also careful not to press against a closed door, demanding from God something that I may feel an urgent need for, but only to serve my desires. Instead, I urged myself to do my best to discern and follow God's will by being attentive to my actions and external circumstances. So one day God gave me the indication, for I'm truly an indecisive person, someone who takes a long time to take up my mind.
I was even a little apprehensive of my decision. If I do choose monasticism, how will I follow through on it? Our convent spiritual father, Archpriest Andrei Limishonak, never advised us definitively one way or the other, marriage or monasticism. He was never directive. As I heard him say multiple times in his conversations, people must make their own choices and take responsibility for their decisions. But one day I had a sense of false certainty that I should choose monasticism. It was not a voice from above or a bolt of lightning. It was a sense of inner calm and deep confidence. Father Andrei gave his blessing, of course, and so my life as a convent began. I remember my first day. But let me mention one thing first. We are not a usual monastery. We have a large number of Sisters of Mercy. Uh, they are secular women, someone's wives, sisters and daughters. They may study or hold secular jobs, but they dedicate their free time to helping the sick. They visit hospitals and long-term care patients, as I have already said. My life before monasticism was connected with this sisterhood. I was a part of it for six years before joining the convent. And there is a deep connection between the sisterhood and the convent. They are white and black sisters, as we refer to them among ourselves. White sisters live in the world, and the black sisters reside in the convent. We have weekly meetings with Father Andrei, where we discuss spiritual matters and everyday questions from the life of the convent and the sisterhood. So, my life had been closely connected to the convent even before I joined it. I realized, much to my surprise, that my first day as a nun differed little from any other, but I do remember the awe with which I walked along the convent's corridors, where only the monastic sisters were allowed. When I entered my cell, which we call the rooms at the convent where the sisters lived, I was filled with so much awe and trembling. The sisters and the new surroundings seemed so new and unusual to me. I felt like speaking quietly, looking down and following obediences, saying only, Father bless. With time, however, there came the understanding that I was still a human person, like any other, still far from an angel and with many daily needs. Uh, leaving my past life behind was not difficult. Honestly, many of the difficulties were only in my mind. Eventually, one comes to realize that one lives among people and that one should pay attention to them, uh, talk to them and not run away from anyone. Likewise, one should only seek a blessing, a permission to engage in any ascetic practices. And the practice of asceticism is ultimately not the main thing. Instead, one should pay attention to one's inner life. When one takes vows before God, it happens in a church before the altar, the most holy part of a temple. Tonjures are not performed by a priest, but by a bishop or metropolitan, a high-ranking church hierarch. Monasticism should be taken seriously. A promise to God is not made to be broken. God alone knows what happens to people who leave monasticism after taking tonjure. These things do happen. God loves everybody, and He gives them a chance at the last minute to repent, ask for forgiveness, and make amends. Only God knows the ways of a person and the how and why of what happened to him. We are not living behind closed doors. Every day we walk outside the convent's gates. Today I have traveled from Minsk to Maladechna without any escort. Our gates are open, but we are not going anywhere. 
That is because we have a bond within us and we have made a promise from our hearts. I have never had any regrets about my choice and I thank God for it. These tempting thoughts always hover around. That is because there are spirits of evil under the sky. We speak of angels and also of demons, and demons try to impart on us their evil thoughts, and these thoughts fly around us like pesky flies. When my mother knew of my decision to join the convent, she had no objection to it at all. She is also a believer. That is not to say that every believer will accept their daughter's choice of monasticism with ease. Of course, it is difficult. On the day we parted, she blessed me with an icon and made the sign of the cross, and it was a special moment and a very moving one. I also appreciated how difficult it was for her. Her grief is earthly and human. Her only daughter, whom she had raised without a father and to whom she had dedicated all her life, was now leaving her to live in a convent. It was not easy for her, of course, but she did not share it with me. She gave me her blessing. And then she walked out into the field and cried for hours, as she told me later. I often get to see my mother. She works at the convent too. I see her almost every day. She comes to church and she is a part of the sisterhood. In the end, she was the one who brought me to the convent. She is a member of the church and she is always near me. To most others, my choice of monasticism was very much a surprise. I had not told my friends anything. I simply went to Father Andrei and I was already wearing my black habit a day later. Many were in a bit of shock. We live in a cell, sharing it with one or two other sisters. Our day starts with a worship service. It is called the Midnight Office. It starts at quarter to six, uh, then follows the liturgy, which ends around nine, followed by obediences. We go to work to speak in worldly terms. I work with the products of our workshops, ceramics, icons and books. I create electronic price lists and use email in my work. Uh, we work all day and then we come together for dinner, which everyone must attend. All the sisters come, uh, we read a book uh, by a church father, we read different books. After that we return to work until 5 or 6 o'clock and then come together again for the Vespers. This timetable does not change for the whole week. We have no television. We only use the internet if we need it for our job. The internet and phones are a bit of a distraction. They take up a lot of our time. But the modern world is like that, and we need to, to make some concessions to it. Why do people join monasteries? I think they do it with a strong sense of God's love. Having experienced God's love, few people can find the same joy in anything in this world as His love and His grace can give them. One can have favorite pastimes, or hobbies, or even engage in doing good works in the world, but they will not have the same sense of God's grace and joy. The question of whether people join a monastery because of some tragedy or grief is common among lay people. Why did you leave? You are so young. Um, something must have happened in your life. Something must be wrong, many speculate. After all this time at the convent, I have become convinced that no person will stay in a monastery if they had joined it only because something had gone wrong, out of grief or fear. 
People simply do not come to a monastery for these reasons. It either does not happen, or it is only a momentary temptation that brings someone to a monastery for a short while, and he will leave it after five days or so, because he is simply not ready for it spiritually. These people sure will not stay. My sisters, those who are at the convent now, have answered the call of God's love. That is because the service that they do among the sick, uh, the long-term patience, gives them a sense of power and commitment, so strong that they will not live anywhere. It motivates them to continue and grow in spirit. I have never wanted to go back to the world. And certainly, as I was traveling to meet you today, I drove through the streets where I used to live and play and where I grew up. I thank God for this time of my life and for all that happened to me. It was nice to go back to my old surroundings. Still, I have no desire to return. Life is going on, and I have so many good things to look forward to. A nun must have a blessing from the spiritual father or abbess to visit her family. She cannot just visit for a cup of coffee. It is a kind of discipline and inner obedience. Frequent visits for tea or coffee could become a habit that may give rise to something else to which one's soul could grow attached with time. These pleasures of the world, the enjoyable moments, are surpassed by the grace of God and His love. We spent all of our time at the convent, that's true. The church, convent and obediences make our day. They are our routine, day in and day out. But in truth, no day is like another. Every day is unique. That is because we seek to live an inner life, independent of our external circumstances, and we look after our souls, we try to discern God's presence in simple things. We look to this invisible connection, so maybe that can make us less dependent on the more visible things. We can go out of town, to our farmstead, where we are allowed to spend time, to walk in a forest or along the banks of a lake. There are several forest lakes nearby. This is a valuable option, as the convent is in the city, and its noise never stops for a minute. For Silence and seclusion are important, especially in the countryside. But they are also essential for any person. It is nice to appreciate the silence away from radios, phones or stereo. It is refreshing to watch the clear sky the scenery, the green forest, and the golden fields. Everybody needs it, monastics especially. I feel that I am living where I belong, and I am following the way given to me by the Lord. I hope that I will persevere in it. I am saying I am hopeful because I am aware of the many temptations that might arise. So I am not speaking with surety, only with hope. I trust that the Lord will hold my hand and lead me to where He wants me to be.
To conclude, let me wish you a life full of kindness, warmth, reassuring words, good deeds, and beauty. Let your days be filled with joy and may you always have the patience to bear burdens of another and stick up for love. I wish you all the blessings from the Lord.